Well, tonight's question, tonight's question is, who did the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam see on the fifth summer? So when it comes up, you can, you can see it, inshallah. Okay, we ready. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan ar-rajim, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salam ala ashraf al-mursaleen, sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, night number eight of uh, this Ramadan. Subhanallah is going so quickly, so, so quickly. Three weeks time, the man kakers are going to be looking, is it Eid, Sunday or Monday? So, subhanallah, three weeks to go. So may Allah grant us uh, istiqamah and steadfastness and increase as we get closer to, to the end of the month, inshallah. We continue with our series on the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his seerah, the mercy to the worlds. And we spoke about, and tonight, inshallah, is going to be uh, 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 you know, a, a lecture where we will hear about the lowest point in the Nabi Sallallahu life and perhaps the highest point in his life. The greatest calamities that he went through were the greatest blessing that Allah had given him. And subhanAllah, the lesson from that is when you go through these tribulations of life, if you are patient, what Allah gives you afterwards will be so much, so much better. So we said yesterday that the Nabi Sallallahu lost Khadija, who was the closest person to him and the first to believe in him. Khadija radiallahu anha, and this left a deep scar, a wound in his heart. In fact, some of the Sahaba said, the Nabi sallam, who is always described as smiling, we did not see him smile for many, many months after the death of Khadija radiallahu anha. And then of course was the death of Abu Talib, who not only the fact that he died, which was sad because this was like his father, he also died on disbelief. So the Nabi sallam felt extremely, extremely sad that his uncle did not embrace Islam. And then of course, what made it worse was that that protection that Abu Talib afforded the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was now gone and Abu Lahab becomes the chief of the Banu Hashim and we know how Abu Lahab is with the, uh, his position. So the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam very soon after the death of Abu Talib he makes the decision that SubhanAllah I don't see myself moving forward here in Mecca at any time someone can harm me, someone could uh, abuse me or even kill me let me seek protection from the city closest to Mecca. And the closest city outside of Mecca, it's called the, uh, the city of Taif, it's still there today. It's further up in the mountains, it has a bit of a different climate, it's cooler, it's lush, it's green. And so the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam walks to Taif uh, uh, along with his adopted son Zayd ibn Haritha radiallahu anhu. And they go into the city of Taif and there the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam spends 10 days calling the people to Islam. Now Taif had three leaders who were in charge and each three of all, the three of them, after the Nabi spoke to them, they had, their response was extremely sarcastic. The one said, Ya Allah, if you are a messenger, then we might as well break the Kaaba and take away the cloak and you know, khalas, we might as well give up on life. The other one said, that has Allah not found anyone better than you to be his messenger? Could he not find a better man to deliver his message than you? And the last one said, Yo, subhanAllah, I can't speak to you. Because if you're a really a prophet, then you're far too holy for me to address you. And if you're a liar, well, then I don't want to speak to you in any case. So please don't talk to me. So the sarcastic attitude hurt the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He then went for 10 days, as I said, he was in uh, Taif. He started preaching in the markets, in the streets. And the people in Taif, uh, look, they already heard about him in Mecca. And they started laughing at him, ridiculing him, swearing at him, insulting him. One or two people looked like they were interested and when they came forward to get more information and were about to embrace Islam, that's when the leader said, call, called the gangs of Taif, like every city you've got your gangsters, your, your youngsters that have nothing better to do, stone him, they said. And subhanAllah, as we know, the Nabi Sallallahu was pelted, you know, and Zaid behind him trying to block the blows, but the Nabi Sallallahu was you know, injured from head to toe and Zaid bleeding and they had to flee down the mountain for six, seven miles they ran uh, until they were uh, uh, in safety. And subhanAllah, you know, there's a beautiful hadith where Aisha radiallahu anha asked the Nabi what was the, what was, what was the worst day? Uh, was there a worse day for you then? The battle of Uhud. When we get to the battle of Uhud, inshallah, we'll know the Nabi always died in that battle. So Aisha didn't know much besides Uhud was bad. So the Nabi said, yes, there was a day worse than that. It was this day of Taif. But look at the way he, he narrates the story. He says, the day of Taif, your people, he says, the Quraysh, they, they gave me bad treatment. And when I spoke to them, they insulted me. And so I was sorrow and heartbroken. He didn't explain the graphic details of this and that. The Nabi Sallallahu was never a victim. And he never told, I mean, Aisha never knew that this was the worst day of your life. SubhanAllah, us, if we had a bad day in the queue, we, the whole world knows, Facebook knows how terrible our day was. The Nabi Sallallahu he doesn't spread it around and he just said, they gave me bad treatment and I was very hurt and very mournful. So the Nabi Sallallahu bloodied, bruised, beaten, physically almost killed, 
what was difficult for him was where to from here. Mecca has there's a dead end. Taif is even worse. And there we know in this place between Mecca and Taif, basically in the middle of nowhere, the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi makes this deepest, most saddest of dua that he, you know, that we know from him. He raises his hands and he says, Oh Allah, to you alone I complain of my helplessness. It's okay to complain, but only complain to Allah. You alone, Ya Allah, I complain of my helplessness. And my, the, the meagerness of my resources, how inferior I am in terms of my resources, and how insignificant I am, how, how, I, how lowly I am in the sight of mankind. Oh Allah, you are the most merciful of those who show mercy. You are the Lord of the helpless ones. And you are the Lord of the weak. And you are my Lord. You are my Rabb. Into whose hands do you leave me? Into the hands of an, uh, a distant relative who has taken control over me, meaning Abu Lahab, or an enemy, or, 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 or an uh, uh, outsider who means harm upon me, meaning the people of Taif. Then he says, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi now, and this is the beauty of dua. When you complain, we don't complain, Ya Allah, why, why, why? We say, Ya Allah, look how difficult my situation is. And then he says, Ya Allah, in spite of all these things, so long as you are not angry with me, then I'm okay. Then I will persevere. Then I will not worry. I will continue. So long as you are not angry with me, Ya Allah. If all of this that's happening is a test, I accept it. But if you are angry with me, Ya Allah, then I'm worried. Then he says, And I seek your protection in the light, in the nur of your face, which illuminates the heavens and dispels all the darkness. And which all, which controls, I seek protection in you, which controls all affairs in this world and in the next. May it never be, Ya Allah, that I should incur your displeasure, Ya Allah. So long as you are not displeased with me. Or that you should be uh, angry with me. And there's no power and there's none, no one that can change the situation except you, Ya Allah. And so the Nabi Sallallahu makes this very, very sad dua saying to Ya Allah, I'm so weak, I'm so insignificant, please don't abandon me. And we know that it, wa it wasn't now that Surah Wad Duha was revealed, but now we understand the meaning of Surah Wad Duha when Allah says, Ma wadda'aka rabbuka wa ma qala. Wadda'aka, like we said at the end of Ramadan, Alwida, goodbye. Allah says, Ma wadda'aka, I haven't said goodbye to you. Wa ma qala, and I'm not angry with you. Wa al akhiratu khayrun laka min al ula. And in the end, O oh Muhammad, وسلم, it will be a lot better than it is now. Wa la sawfa yu'tika rabbuka fatarda. Allah says, I will give you that which will make you, which will make you happy. On the way back from the, to, towards Makkah, so the Nabi has to go back to Makkah. And something amazing, already now, the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam begin to see the, the uh, miracles of, uh, of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala. Just before he left to Makkah, we also know that Allah had given permission to destroy the people of Taif. You know, when you abuse a prophet to this level, then the punishment is justified against them. And we know the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in his mercifulness, he said to Jibreel, leave them, I make dua that from them their children will be believers, and so the people of Taif were spared. On his way back to Makkah, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala had caused an encounter between the Nabi Sallallahu and a tribe of jinn. And the jinn, as we know, live out in the outskirts. They don't live uh, uh, amongst people. And so Allah says, Kul uhiya, in Surah Jinn, surah, there's a surah about this event, Kul uhiya ilayya annahu istama'u nafarun min al-jinni faqalu inna sami'na Qur'anan ajaba. The, Allah says, say, it has been revealed to me that a tribe of jinn listened to the Qur'an and they said, verily we have heard a wonderful recitation, yahdi ila rushd, it, it, it calls you to the right path and we have believed therein. The, the message to the Nabi Sallallahu you just give the message. You don't know who's going to accept. Even the jinn will accept. If people don't accept your message, the jinn will accept your message. So the Nabi Sallallahu uh, encountered the jinn and spent some time with them. And then he returned back to, to the city of Mecca. Before he entered, he had to ask one of the noble people, please give me protection. Give me a visa that you will protect me and that I'm, I will not be killed. SubhanAllah, look at this, how, how, uh, um, how difficult the situation is for the Nabi Sallallahu it's also mentioned in this time and maybe a few months later or so that the Sahaba were very worried about the Nabi Sallallahu He was sad, gloomy. He was giving his da'wah, but he didn't have the Khadija that stood behind him. And so they suggested, why don't you get married again, Ya Rasulullah? You're 50 years old. You're still uh, at the age to be married. And so he said, he's not looking for these kind of things, uh, uh, you know, and who could replace Khadija? So they convinced him that uh, you should get married. And so he said, okay, suggest someone. Who, who do you suggest? So they said to him, Ya Rasulullah Sallallahu either you marry a young woman who's just come to marital age, she's now ready to get married. And we said, who is that? Aisha, the daughter of Bakr. So he's, Nabi Sallallahu said, I'm not, a young, cute wife is not what I need right now. So they said, in that case, if you need a mature, uh, uh, experienced lady, then we suggest Sauda binti Zam'ah, our mother Sauda. And she was one of those ladies who migrated to Abyssinia with her husband, and then he died. 
And so subhanAllah, she was a widow. She was older than the Nabi Sallallahu And Aisha describes her as a, a large lady, a big auntie that was filled with love. Aisha says, I did not admire anyone more than Soda. She had so much love for everyone. Her only concern was to make the people around her happy, to make the people around her, to feed them, to, you know, we know those aunties, they just bring joy wherever they are. And so the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam married our mother Soda, binti Zam'a, she immediately took charge of his household. Um, she even tried to bring some uh, cheer in his life. She mentions as a hadith, very few hadith of our mother Soda. She saw the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was a bit gloomy, and it's understandable why it's gloomy. So she said, Ya Rasulullah Sallallahu can I tell you something humorous? She said, what happened? You didn't realize last night while you were performing tahajjud, I stood behind you. Now we know the Nabi Sallallahu tahajjud was very long. I just, ah. And then you went into ruku for so long, and I tried to follow you, and then eventually I felt like my nose was about to bleed, so I held my nose in ruku. Now she's showing him bent over, holding her nose, and so the Nabi Sallallahu smiled at that, and she felt so good, I could bring a smile back to, to the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But the thing that would really give him back his, his, um, his motivation and, and strengthen him is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala giving him the best gift, and that is that gift of the Isra and the Mi'raj. About a year or two before the Hijrah, we know that the Nabi sallam went on this amazing journey. And it's referenced in the Quran in Surah Al Isra. Isra, there's two parts to this journey there's a domestic leg and there's an international leg. The domestic one, the, 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 the shorter journey, is the Isra, which is a journey by night from Mecca to Jerusalem. Then the Mi'raj is the ascension, the Nabi Sallallahu rising up through the heavens. And both of them are mentioned in the Quran. As for the Isra, Allah says, Subhanallah, the Asra, all praise be to Allah who took his servant by night in the Isra from Masjid al Haram to Masjid al Aqsa, whose surroundings we have blessed. Why? To show him, Linuriyahu min ayatina, so that we can show him of the great signs of Allah. So Allah was going to show the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam some amazing, amazing signs. And as for the uh, uh, Mi'raj, the word Mi'raj actually means a lift, an elevator. So the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this isn't, uh, uh, the word Mi'raj is in the Quran, but Allah mentions in Surah Najm, ma kathab al fuadu ma ra'a, that the heart of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was not lying what he saw. Will you dispute with him over what he saw? And certainly, he, the Nabi Sallallahu saw him a second time. Who this him is, we'll talk about that inshallah. He saw him in the Sidrat al-Muntaha. The Prophet saw this amazing being at Sidrat al-Muntaha, the tree of uppermost limit. In the Jannat al-Ma'wa, very close to where Jannah is. إِذْ يَخْشَ سِدْرَةُ مَا يَخْشَ سِدْرَةَ مَا يَخْشَ When the tree was covered by what it was covered. مَا زَاغَ الْبَصْرُ وَمَا طَغَى The sight of the Nabi Sallallahu did not swerve, nor did it transgress. لَقَدَ رَآهُ مِنْ آيَاتِ رَبِّهِ الْكُبْرَى Allah showed him, he saw of Allah's greatest, greatest signs. So what exactly happened on this journey? And we're going to summarize quickly. SubhanAllah, the most amazing event, maybe in five minutes here. The Nabi Sallallahu says, I was sleeping. And then Jibreel ascended in my room, woke me up, and took me to the Haram. So we went to the Kaaba and we made two rakaahs in the Hatim, Hijr al-Ismail. And Jibreel brought a bowl of Zamzam and Iman. And then once again, he opened my chest and put it inside this liquid. He put it inside my heart to give me strength. Then a creature bigger than a donkey but smaller than a horse was brought forward. And this thing is called Burak. By the way, Burak doesn't have wings. It looks like a, like a, tiny, like a donkey. And, then, and uh, the Nabi Sallallahu was about to get on Burak when he started to kick and become a bit agitated. And Jibreel said to, this, uh, to the Burak, how dare you? Shame on you, Burak. This is the most blessed person to ever ride you, ever. So now we know Burak has been ridden before. By who Allah knows by whom. But he's saying to the Burak, calm down. This is the greatest rider that has ever mounted you. And so Jibreel also climbs behind the Nabi Sallallahu on the Burak. And the Burak, as the Nabi said, is extremely, as far as you can see, he jumps uh, to, in that direction. And within no time, they arrived at Jerusalem. Interesting, at this point, Jerusalem was Umazz al-Aqsa, the plateau where you, where you see the Dome of the Rock, that whole area was a dumping ground. The Jews completely, I mean the Romans, flattened it. And so when the Nabi Sallam arrives there, there is no masjid, but Allah put before him the masjid of Nabi Sulaiman. And he entered the masjid. And interesting, he said, I tied Burak on the same post that all the Nabis tied their animals. And therefore the Anbiya had a special parking. And therefore it's okay for the Imam to have a special parking also. Allah. Anyway, so, so the Prophet Sallam enters the masjid. And he sees, he says, I saw the Anbiya before me. Musa was standing there and Isa and Ibrahim and he describes how they looked. And then I was put to the front and there was one long saf, all the Anbiya, one saf. And I was the Imam. I made salah as the Imam. And the symbolism here, that you are the Imam of all of humanity, of all of mankind. You are its, its leader. And this Ummah, subhanAllah, is then the leader of all the Ummahs that will come. 
the last, we are the last to come, but the first to enter Jannah, may we be amongst them, Ameen. Then, Jibreel, after the Salah was finished now, the Anbiya were brought in spirit form, and then they went back to wherever they were. Jibreel now said, now we will ascend. But before he could ascend, two options were placed before him. Two containers, one with milk and one with khamar. And he said, choose and choose for your ummah. And so the Nabi chose milk, and Jibreel said, this was the correct choice, and this is your, for your whole ummah, your ummah will be on this fitra. There will be a pureness to your ummah. And so the Nabi Sallallahu said, we began to rise. And as we rose through the first sama, now I must say, what's the difference between sama and jannah? Sama are, think of it as universes, multiverses, right? Multiverses. Whereas jannah is paradise. The jannah is not inside the sama. There are seven of these universes stacked one upon the other. The Nabi says, the smallest sama, our sama, a dunya, compared to the next one, is like a ring in the desert. We are the ring, and the next sama is the desert. And everything we see of the universe far into the distant galaxies is only part of sama dunya Because Allah says, وَلَقَدَ زَيَّنَّ sama الدُّنْيَا بِمَصَابِيحِ The lowest sama, the smallest sama, is the one that has stars. And so the Nabi ascends through the first universe. And when he reaches the end, there is a immigration, there is a checkpoint with our angels. And they say, and subhanAllah, side note, all of us will take this journey. When? When you die. And you will get to that checkpoint. And the angels will ask, who is here at this? Who wants to pass through? And if you're a good person, you pass. And if you're not, they will say, you have no permission to end. And they will cast you down. May Allah protect us. So Jibreel then says, I, it's Jibreel, and with me is Muhammad. And they say, Muhammad, oh, ahlan wa sahlan, the doors of the sama are open. And the Nabi enters into the next, the second sama, and there he sees our father, Adam, alayhi salam. Now, Nabi Adam doesn't live there. He was brought as a welcoming delegation. And Nabi Adam embraces him, welcome my son, my, a, a blessed son, and a pious Nabi. And so then the Nabi sallam continues to ascend. And each time he gets to the checkpoint of every sama, there's angels and a Nabi to welcome him. In the second sama, now pay attention, each sama is a special Nabi. At the second sama, he meets whom? Nabi Isa and Nabi Yahya. Why? Remember, they were the last two Nabis to come before him. Nabi Isa and Nabi Yahya. Then, sallallahu alayhi then he went to the third sama. And at that sama was Nabi, Yunus, Nabi Yusuf, alayhi salam. That's where he said, wow, never saw a more beautiful man than Yusuf, alayhi salam. Why Yusuf, perhaps? Remember, the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi is being cast out by his own family. What happened to Nabi Yusuf? His own brothers tried to kill him. Then the Nabi Sallallahu met Nabi Idris in, Nabi, in, in Sama number four. And Allah Alam, we don't know much about Nabi Idris. Then number five, he met Nabi Harun. Number six, Nabi Musa. And at number six, now, all the Anbiya, they just greeted and it was very formal. Nabi Musa, as Nabi Sallallahu is walking away, and we know the personality of Nabi Musa. He always speaks his mind. He says, SubhanAllah, this young man, this young youngster, he's going to have a bigger ummah than me. You know, it's, he's going to have a bigger ummah than my ummah. And so the Nabi Sallallahu then ascends to the seventh sama, and in the sama number seven, Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam. And really, subhanAllah, you can see the personalities. Nabi Ibrahim is very chilled. And he's relaxing, leaning against, or like reclining against the bayt al-ma'mur, the haram of the angels. So in sama number seven, Allah speaks, this is in the Quran, Allah mentions that there is al-bayt al-ma'mur, the haram of the angels. And every day, 70,000 angels enter this haram to make a type of hajj, and they're only allowed to come one day in their life. And as I always joke, they also have a sawuk, they also have a quota system, they also, their name comes out once, and they can never go again. Okay? But Nabi Ibrahim, alayhi salam, he's relaxing like he's got all the time in the world to be at bayt al-ma'mur. Why? Because he built the haram on earth. And so Nabi Ibrahim uh, embraces the Nabi Sallallahu and he says again, Welcome, O pious son and blessed Nabi. And he says a very interesting, he says, Give my salams to your ummah, subhanAllah. And it's amazing that we give salam to Nabi Ibrahim. Allah salli ala wa ala sayyidina, kama salli ta'ala Nabi Ibrahim. We mention Nabi Ibrahim in our salah. So he said, Give my salams to your ummah and tell them, I have seen in Jannah. And the Jannah is very fertile, but it needs your, subhanAllah, your tasbih, your, 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 your dhikr to plant trees. Every time you say, Allahu Akbar, Allah gives you a tree. SubhanAllah, Allah gives you a tree. So tell them the Jannah is waiting for them. The Nabi Sallallahu now ascends. He met Nabi Ibrahim in Sama number seven. He saw the Bayt al-Ma'mur, the Haram of the angels, and he keeps going higher and higher. To the highest point of Sama number seven, the peak, that is Sidrat al-Muntaha, the tree, the low tree of upper Muslim. Muntaha means the end of the line. You can't go beyond that. At that point, Jibreel, who was in human form, now goes into his angel form. He goes into his true form. The Nabi saw Jibreel in his true form. And that's when Allah says in the Quran, and he saw him a second time. The first time was Ikra, when he saw Jibreel in his true form. Now he saw Jibreel once again in his true form with all his wings spread out, covering the entire 
the horizon. And then as they keep ascending, it was at this point that the last two verses of Surah Baqarah was given to the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Something very interesting, those two, the last two verses, Amin al-Rasul of Ma'unzilai, those last two, two verses, the only verses of the Qur'an received outside of this dunya. And that's why the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, whoever recites those last two verses before you go to sleep, it is enough for you for the evening as a protection. And some even said as a qiyamu layl in terms of a, a reward. Continuing rising until Jibreel cannot go any further. And now the Nabi Sallallahu would pass a point where no other Nabi has ever, no human, no creature has ever gone above Sidrat al-Muntaha. And he says, I went alone, and as I passed Sidrat al-Muntaha, I heard the writing of the Qalam, the pen of destiny. It's writing, whatever it's writing. And he continued to ascend. Now we know above that is the Kursi, Aytul Kursi, the footstool of Allah. And above the Kursi is what? Before the Arsh we get, wa arshuhu ala al-ma. Allah's throne is on an ocean of water. In the Quran, Allah says, His throne is on water. So there's an ocean of water. Interesting, all life is made of water. Perhaps from this, this special water, all life comes from. And so Allah's arsh, His throne is on the water. And then above the, above the water is the throne of Allah. And above that, Allah, and Allah uh, uh, above all uh, uh, likeness, above that is the Lord of the arsh. And then the Nabi Sallallahu as we know, was in the audience of the Rabbul Alameen, Allah Himself. The Prophet did not see Allah. There was a veil of light between Allah and the Nabi Sallallahu But that is where Allah had given the Nabi Sallallahu the commandment of 50 salah. And then the Nabi Sallallahu received that and we don't know what else was discussed that was between Allah and the Nabi Sallallahu He descends once again and he passes Nabi Ibrahim. When he gets to Nabi Musa, we know the story, Nabi Musa of such an outspoken person. Now Nabi Musa had a journey like this before, remember? He went to meet Allah. In the, in the cave for 40 days, and then he got the Torah, the Ten Commandments. Nabi Musa asks Nabi Sallallahu what did Allah tell you? <laughs> what, was, uh, what was given to you and your Ummah? And so the Nabi Sallallahu said, my Lord has prescribed 50 salawat. And Nabi Musa said, oh, your Ummah is never going to do that. 50 salah, no ways. I know Bani Israel, they couldn't do you know, a fraction of that. Go back and ask Allah to reduce it. The Nabi Sallallahu was a bit surprised at this. And he looks at Jibreel as if to ask, can I do that? Jibreel said yes, and the Nabi Sallam returns back to uh, Nabi Sallam returns back to Allah, and we don't know how many times. Eventually, when he came down to five, limited from fifty to five salawat, even so, Nabi Musa said five is a lot for your ummah. They're not going to do five. Make it less. Make it less. So the Nabi Sallam says, "Istahi, I'm now shy. I'm too shy to go back, and I'm happy with five. And then Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said the voice of Allah could be heard. And these are the only two Nabis who heard the voice of Allah in a manner which befits His Majesty. Allah said, now my decree is made, is confirmed, and five is upon the Ummah, but the reward of 50 will remain. The reward of 50 will remain. And this is for, this is between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is for us, the Ummah. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam descends, and interesting, he meets Nabi once again on his way back. He meets the Anbiya. He asked each Nabi about Qiyamah. Nabi Ibrahim said, I don't know anything else about Qiyamah. Nabi Musa said, I don't know anything else about Qiyamah. Nabi Isa said, I know something. I need to come back and I need to fight Dajjal. And the Nabi saw Dajjal on the Isra Adam. He saw the way he looked and that's where he said, I saw him having an eye that is deformed. And the Nabi saw into Jannah and he saw into Jahannam and he met Malik, the angel of Jahannam and greeted Malik. When he greeted Malik, in fact, Malik greeted him first. The Nabi said to Jibreel, what's wrong with this angel? He's not so happy to see me. All the other angels are smiling, marhaban, happy. It's Malik, no smiles. So Nabi Jibreel said to the Nabi Sallam, this is Malik, he is the gatekeeper of Jahannam and he's not capable of smiling. There is no happiness in Malik. But if ever you were to smile, it would be for you. But Malik is unable to smile. May we never meet Malik. I mean, the Nabi Sallam now descends back to, the, back to Jerusalem on the Burak, back to Makkah. He sees a few caravans along the way. He notices, he uh, sees things and he returns to his bed. And he thinks to himself, subhanAllah, how am I going to tell the Quraysh about this tomorrow? They already think I'm a madman. How am I going to tell them about this tomorrow? Inshallah, we'll discuss that bi'ibnillah tomorrow bi'ibnillah. Jazakallah khair. Just quick, quick, quick. Our second crossword puzzle is, is coming out, I think, tomorrow evening. For those who are filling in the crossword, a special prize, inshallah, tomorrow. And uh, it's, you can submit it either online or give the card in uh, at, the box, at the back. Last night's question, quiz. How long did the Nabi stay in Taif? For 10 days. For those who fold it in, let's see how lucky draw, insha'Allah. Alia Ariftin. Is she here? She is here. Okay, so Sister Alia, mashallah to you, and uh, here's your prize. And today's question, which Nabi did the Nabi see at Nama, Sama number 5? In heaven number 5, 
Sama number five, who did he see? Which Nabi Harun, Musa, or Yusuf? Jazakallah khair, wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Muhammad, wa ala alihi sahbihi sallam, wa 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 sallam, wa